Hello, I'm Jerry Dearman. Welcome to the Solid Lives Weekly Message. Let me say again, thank you to all of you who have been sowing, giving, tithing, because we're making such great progress. And so pay attention to all of the announcements that are going out, the emails that are going out, because great things are happening right now, and you've been a big part of it. Now, we've got another good word for you today, so I want you to grab your Bible, open your heart to receive, and let's allow the ministry of the Word to come into our lives and into our hearts and change us once again. Go ahead and open up today to Proverbs chapter 7. And uh, this message today is really simple. In fact, I would almost consider it like a half message today. It's a, it's a little bit of a shorter than usual message. And I know that devastates you, but bear with me here, okay? It's a little bit shorter than usual, but it's intentional because I felt like the Lord said to leave some time to respond at the end. In fact, multiple times I went back to this message and I went to add a few verses and to go into a couple other points. And I felt like the Lord said, no, let the simplicity of what I'm trying to say resonate with people. And then give them time to respond. And so today really is a shorter message. It's a simple message, but I believe it's so valuable and important for us as believers to catch this. And the title of today's message is Eternally Minded. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, Eternally Minded. You know, the Word of God has a way of pulling our perspectives up, right? The Word of God pulls our perspective above just ourselves. It pulls it above the here and now, above our issues, or above even just our own life. It reminds us of the big picture. While this life that we live does the opposite. This life does a great job at demanding attention on the here and now. This life does an incredible job at compelling us to make ourselves the top priority. This life does a great job at elevating our issues above the name of Jesus and causes us to prioritize this life over the next. So being eternally minded, this simple thing that I think God is calling us to talk about uh, today is something that will deeply impact the way that you do your day-to-day -day life if you can catch what the Lord is trying to say today. <clears throat> Excuse me, by the way, pardon me if I sound like I lost my voice at any point. It's because I did. I had to yell at the first two services a little bit. They weren't getting it. You know how they are. So I had to just really, but you guys are not like that. So no, I, I did lose my voice a little bit, but, um, but I think the Lord can speak even through a raspy lost voice as well. But this this idea of being eternally minded is not something you just default end up in. Being kingdom minded is something you must pursue. And if you don't pursue it, you will not end up in it because the default mode, what you will just slip into is being conformed to the way the rest of the world thinks. We have to fight and press towards being kingdom minded and being eternally minded. You know, the way that we make decisions is based on our values, right? This is why what, when, I, when we talk to young couples, the most important thing as you're entering into marriage is that your values are aligned. More specifically, your values on the word of God, who Jesus is and serving and following him. And the reason why is because when you get married, and sometimes one thing we can over uh, emphasize going into marriage is how physically attractive they are. And it's important that you're physically attracted to them, but you're gonna interact with them physically such a small percentage of the time, the vast majority of your marriage, you're gonna be interacting with their values, what they believe, what they hang on to, what they value as greater versus, versus less important. That's what you're gonna be interacting with in marriage. And so that's why it's so important that we make sure that our values are aligned and you don't have to be a mathematician to know that if you took any math problem and just adjusted some of the values or inserted or took away a value, it would change the outcome of the entire problem. The result of that math problem would be changed by adjusting the values. And here's, here's what I believe the Lord is proposing to us today is that if we improperly value eternity in our lives, we will come out with the wrong answers. We will operate based on a faulty system and a faulty uh, foundation. But if we can take eternity and value that in its proper place, it will change the way that we make decisions. It will change the way that we operate and the way that we move. Have you ever been tunnel visioned? Tunnel vision where you are in a moment and the moment is so infectious or so strong that it's like everything else in the big picture doesn't matter. You're just 
caught up. And I'll give you an example. Have you ever said something that immediately upon saying it, you wish you could take it back, right? But the heat in the moment, you're just angry, you're irritated. So you say something and you don't realize if you, if you were able to take a step back in that moment, you would say, what I just said there is more costly than it's worth. That will cost me something that when I take a step back and evaluate is not worth it. Uh, some of you may have done this before because you just told your boss off. You're like, I just had to let them know in that moment how they're this and they're that and all of that. And you may feel good about it for about 10 minutes until you realize, oh shoot, I don't have a job anymore. Right now I'm unemployed because I did that. Because in the heat of a moment, you were so focused on the here and now that you missed the big picture. Kids are like this. My kiddos who just walked out right now with an adult. <laughs> they, they, I believe both of these kiddos, if I told both of these kiddos, certainly the younger one, but if I told both of these kiddos and said, hey, I will give you an ice cream sandwich today, or I will give you $10,000 at your next birthday. I believe both of them would take the ice cream sandwich today. Why is that? Because there's not, there's not a proper ability to weigh the big picture. They're, they're misallocating value. And we as believers, we can so easily misallocate value in our lives. And we can put value on things that are for today in this life and miss out on the big picture. And so all of that is leading up to what I believe is this simple topic that the Lord wants to address today and a simple thing he's asking us to do, which is to take a step back. I don't know what exactly scenario you're in. I don't know if you're in the middle of a storm. I don't know if life is feeling good right now, if it's feeling tough and bad. Whatever season you're in, I believe the Lord is saying, will you take a step back and look at the big picture and focus your attention on what's really important here? Uh, before I read, actually, yeah, let me read Proverbs chapter seven uh, really quickly. This is just an example of how someone can get tunnel vision in the here and now. It talks about this with regards to, a, uh, in this case, a seductress and a young man who was enticed into fornication or adultery. And uh, Proverbs chapter seven, verses 21 through 22 says, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With, flattering, with her flattering lips, she seduced him. And immediately he went after her, catch this, as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. In other words, like an ox just kind of bumbles their way into the very house that's gonna slaughter them. This is what a young man did in this scenario with this fornication and adultery that he was committing. And what happened? It's because for whatever reason in the moment, he got so locked into the moment that he wasn't thinking clearly about, man, what's this gonna cost? What are the costs that are here? And so here's what I believe the Lord wants to present to us today is this, what moments, what things have you become so sucked into the value of that you're forgetting the big picture? Maybe for some of us, it's a dream house. We're trying to save, we're trying to work extra hours to get a dream house. And it's not that working hard is a bad thing. It's not that getting a great dream house is a bad thing, but it is a bad thing when those are your top priority. Now it's an issue, something that's a good thing. In fact, let me say this, something that is a good thing in and of itself can become a bad thing when it's moved from its proper place. So when you take something that's a good thing, like saving and owning a nice home and you elevate that above God and his kingdom, it's now a bad thing because you put it, on the throne of your heart where it doesn't belong. What things have you improperly valued that are here and now? I wanna look at 1 John chapter two. And I love this verse in 1 John two seventeen. It says this, and the world is passing away. Everybody say passing away. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. While our lives will demand our attention, and they just will. Listen, if, you're, if, you, if you just go with the flow, your life will get crazy in moments. Your life will get busy. You will have bills that say, give me attention. You will have responsibilities, constant things that come up. And we should tend to those things. But those things have a way of not just causing us to tend to them, but causing us to serve them, causing us in some ways to idolize them. And we must be able to take a step back and say, yes, I need to do this thing. But the bigger picture is that there's an eternity waiting for me. There's a God who loves me, who saved me, who's calling me to reach the people around me. We must be eternally minded. We can be so tunnel vision. Have you ever had a moment that you felt like your life is just in that moment? It's just over, right? Your life is done. I, I know sometimes as teenagers, if you've ever interacted with teenagers, sometimes teenagers will feel like the, the storm that they're in, like that's it, right? My life is ruined. I got embarrassed somehow. And, and when you get a little older, you realize life goes on. But I remember being about 15 years old 
<clears throat> and being in high school, and um, at that point, I was homeschooled all the way up until uh, my sophomore year. Then my sophomore year, I went to public school, which was a culture shock for this church kid. Okay, here's how I thought. I thought only really bad people, if they were really upset, said bad words. That's what I thought going into high school. I did not know that everybody basically said bad words, and even if they were excited, right? It's, it's not just if they're angry. And uh, so I was in a culture shock. So here's this little previously homeschooled Christian boy who's in a classroom, who's uh, self-conscious and scared, not knowing how to interact with people and, uh, and all that. And I'm sitting in the back and we're in our science class and I'm sitting on, there are those high chairs and I'm a leaner in my chairs, okay? I just lean. And I leaned a little too far back and the thing just <laughs> went and I toppled. It was like a big commotion, right? Loud and, and obnoxious and all of that. And, uh, and the, the people in the class had the worst reaction they could possibly have, which is that they didn't even laugh, they scoffed, okay? They turned around and went like this. And looked back, oh my gosh. Now, if you interviewed me after that day, I would say, that's it. I can't show my face again. My life is just, it just went down, I'm done, that's it. I had a lot of potential until that chair fall. That was the moment. And why is that? Well, because in that moment, I'm, I'm valuing what happened there and not, not properly evaluating the big picture. Now, fast forward some years and you realize that stuff happens, right? It just happens. Sometimes we're in the moment, maybe you're in a similar moment. Maybe it's not falling off a chair, but maybe it's that your coworkers are talking bad about you. Maybe you find out that somebody you thought had your back didn't, right? And, that, and you feel like you're, that's weighing on you so strongly. And it's so important for us to be able to, as believers, step back and say, yes, this is hard. But the big picture is that through all of this, I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna end up with him for all of eternity. See, we need to be able to take a step back. Compared to eternity, this life is just about nothing at all. As human beings, it's hard for us to comprehend eternity. We, we can try, but we really can't wrap our mind around it. But on this life, we get 100 years maybe. Right? But eternity, it never, ever, ever ends. We'll get through 100 million years and we're not even halfway done. We're barely scratching the surface. We're just getting started. And it's hard to grasp that, but if eternity is real, which it is, according to the Bible, then this life compared to eternity is really absolutely nothing. This life is nothing. And yet we treat this as if this is the big thing and it's not. And we as believers, if we're not careful, we will get sucked right into living this life as if this is the thing. And it's not the thing. It's not, look at what James chapter four, verse 14 says. It says this, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. That's good for some of you right there. Some of you are incredible planners. Anybody like a super planner person in here? You just plan, I think just a few people. Even, I bet there's more in here. They just weren't planning on raising their hands. So it threw them off a little bit. <laughs> we got some super planners in here. And uh, this is saying that, listen, you, no matter how much you plan, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You don't know. Have you ever been told by somebody uh, when it comes to the stock market that they just know that they know that they know that this stock is gonna go up and up and up forever, right? The stock will never, ever come down. And the bottom line is they may be right, this time, but the bottom line is you, you can't actually know this stuff. Stuff could happen, unpredictable things can happen. And this is saying, listen, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And then it asks a really important question. In fact, it asks the question that all of humanity has been asking since the beginning, which is what is your life? Even non-believers will ask, what's the meaning of life? What is this? What is this life that we have? What is this? Well, thankfully, it not only asks the question, but it answers it. But here's how it answers it. It says, what is your life? It says, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You wanna know what your life is? Your life is this, ready? That's your life. Compared to eternity, your life is just, it comes and it goes. You know, everybody that lived in the 1800s had lots of plans, lots of dreams, lots of priorities, families, careers, jobs, farmland that they were working, things they were trying to get through and to, storms that they had, and all of them are gone, are dead. And they don't care at all about any of that stuff anymore. They only care about one thing now. Are they with Jesus or are they not? That's what they care about. And yet us, it's like, it's like we can 
uh, well, for a lot of us, we're all the main characters in our own life, right? Have you ever seen a movie? We all identify with the main character, not the guy in the beginning who got eaten, right? We don't identify with that guy. We identify with the person who made it to the end and then defeated the dinosaurs or whatever in Jurassic Park. That's who we identify with. And yet this is saying, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And your life, even if you live a full, long life, your life is just a vapor. It comes and it goes and that's it in eternity. So don't spend your life working on things and living your life for something that won't last. In other words, if you're gonna make an investment, don't invest in the vapor, invest in the thing that's gonna carry on called eternity. I've said this example before, but as good friends, if we had a friend of ours that was gonna go stay stay in an Airbnb in Florida, Airbnbs are houses that you can rent for a short amount of time. And if someone said, hey, yeah, I got an Airbnb in Florida, I'm gonna go stay up for a week and it's gonna be great. I already hired a contractor. They're gonna be putting a pool in there and we're repainting the walls and we're buying some new furniture for it and, and all of that. As a good friend, you would say to them, hey, why are you investing everything you have in something that's not your actual landing place? You're just, you're just passing through there. Don't invest everything you have in that Airbnb. You're just going in and out of there. Invent, find your long place, like, like your landing place, your home you're gonna stay in and invest in that, right? You wouldn't as a good friend say, hey, yeah, you know what? Get a hot tub too. That's gonna be great. No, you wouldn't. Why? You're just passing through. And listen, this life compared to eternity, we're just passing through. This life compared to eternity is, is as the Bible describes, it is a vapor that comes and goes and that's it. And if you're not careful to maintain a kingdom mind and to, to open up his word and to pursue the Lord and to ask him to renew your mind, then you will get sucked into the way that the world operates, which is the life, this life is the thing. In fact, the way that the world operates is this is your one shot to live it up. So live it up. The world operates that way. The world operates, most people operate as if this is it. So make sure you get everything out of it you can. And that's not the way the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God operates the exact opposite and says, this is not it. Don't focus on this. Focus on what's gonna last forever. It's opposite ways, but if we're not careful as believers, we'll just conform right to the way the world operates and make this life the priority. And it's simply not. I believe the Lord wants to wake some of us up today. Open our eyes to things. I remember growing up in the house with pastors Jerry and Kimberly as my parents. I loved the way my mom would wake me up. And I hated the way my dad would wake me up. Complete opposites. My mom would wake me up with this. This is, this is the right way, by the way, to do it. She would walk in and she would start out. You don't say anything. The first thing you do is you start to rub the head. Okay, that's the first thing you do. And then she would accompany the head rub with a small whisper in the ear. Do you need five more minutes? Okay, <laughs> that's the correct way to wake up a teenager. Okay, and to which I would whisper back, yeah, five or 10. And she'd say, okay, I'll be back. My dad would walk in and turn on the light and say, all right, time to get up. Come on, time to get up. It's time to get ready. Man, two different ways to wake up. <laughs> Actually, recently, my wife woke me up in a way that I, I didn't appreciate, but it was about midnight and, uh, and she woke me up and it was confusing also because she woke me up and she, here's exactly how it went. She, wokes me up, she woke me up, she goes, John, John, I just heard someone come in our back door. John, I just heard someone come in our back door. And I, I said, okay. I said, this is confusing because what you're saying sounds like an emergency, but the way you're saying it is way too like, casual. You know, what are, I said, what are you trying to say to me? Are you sure? You're, she's like, I'm just telling you what I heard. And I heard our back door open and close. And I'm like, I don't know how to approach this scenario because I don't know if I need to go downstairs and like get in fight mode or what I'm doing here. But, uh, but that's what she left me with. So I went downstairs and the one reassurance that I had is we always lock our back door. So I thought there's no way, it's fine. So I walked downstairs, little, little scared, honestly more for the person that would be in there than for me, honestly, <laughs> <laughs> for their sake. <laughs> I just don't wanna hurt them too bad. That's what was on my mind. And I get to the back door and thankfully I'm thinking we always lock it. So I just go and make sure it's locked and I go to open it and it opens, okay? And immediately, you know in those movies where it zooms in and goes, rent, 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 rent. like I had that moment on me and I turned around and I was ready to fight somebody, okay? And so now I'm walking around downstairs and thankfully again, for their sake, I didn't find anyone. Uh, but, 
<clears throat> but a freaky moment nonetheless. Listen, we can all get woken up in different ways. And, and I don't believe the Lord's trying to scare us today, but I do believe he's trying to wake us up today. I do believe he's trying to wake us up because believers, believers are completely susceptible to falling into a spiritual lull or sleep where we just completely conform to the world. And we must battle to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We can even wrap our identities in things that have no eternal value. We can, we can, we can prioritize possessions. We can prioritize uh, accolades from people, getting praise from people, getting respect from people. We can prioritize and stake our identities in something that has no eternal value. I'll give you an example. For me, for the last decade, ever since God initially changed my life as a 19-year-old young man, I immediately jumped into the ministry and was in roles where I was speaking from a platform. I immediately jumped into youth ministry, excuse me, and then I went into being the campus pastor in Lake Elsinore, and then uh, the young adults pastor here, and then the campus pastor here in Anaheim. And just about six months ago, I felt like the Lord was calling me to lean into a role with Jesus' disciple, helping to partner with Pastor Jerry to spearhead the advancement of it, seeing it go all around the world. And this is a very behind the scenes role. This is like a role that I haven't had over the last decade where I'm not up here. I'm not in front of people. And it's actually been a great time because the Lord has been able to remind me that my identity is not staked on being on a platform. My identity is not wrapped in making sure that people see me and people are impacted by me. The Lord's reminded me and it's been such a great time because as I've been doing more behind the scenes work, the Lord has been able to remind me that my identity is staked in first and foremost, being a son of the most high. And second of all, in addition to that, being a minister, not just from a platform. In fact, if you're a minister, if you view ministering as simply an act of the platform, then you don't, you don't understand what being a minister means because God has opened doors to minister to individuals. In fact, we started a Jesus disciple group recently in our own home with one of my buddies from high school and, um, and his girlfriend and their child that they've started coming. And we just had one uh, on Friday night and the Lord's been opening the door and the Lord's called me in a season and said, I'm calling you into a season of more individual ministry, that you're able to, to minister more on an individual level than a platform level. Well, if we're not careful, our identities will be rocked by things like that. If you're not careful, your identity as a business owner or as in your career or as a good coach or whatever it is can get wrapped up into something that has no eternal value. And parents can do this too, by the way. You can make your most important identity being a parent. And then when your kids grow up and leave the house, you don't know who you are anymore. You've lost, you've lost purpose or you've lost touch. And that's because your identity is staked in something that's not eternal. But when we stake our identity in who Christ is and what he did for us and where we're going to be in heaven forever, then no circumstance, no storm, trial, or tribulation can shake our identity because our identity is anchored in something greater than us. Are you catching this today? Are you catching this? So the Lord is calling us to be eternally minded, to make sure that we are constantly reflecting on and pondering, meditating on the big picture and what's really important. I want us to look at the rich young ruler for a second. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. And this is such a, uh, an important interaction that we can learn from here. And it says this, now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. But if you wanna enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you wanna be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful. Everybody say sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Remember we talked in the beginning about where your values are. Where your values are will determine how you weigh things, how you see things. His values were misaligned. And so something that God actually invited him to do that was incredible actually was bad news to him. Did you know that if your values are misaligned, God will call you to do things that will make you sorrowful. That to you, it will be bad news that he's calling you to do something because your values aren't properly aligned because you're not eternally minded. So in this case, think about what Jesus actually invited him to do. Here's what Jesus actually invited him to do. 
He said, young man, he said, if, if you want, here's what you can do. Sell all your possessions, go give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven for all of eternity. And then you can come follow me personally and I'll disciple you. And the rich young ruler viewed that as bad news. Why? Because his mind was on the here and now. And what he had was a great number of possessions. And so what he heard when he heard Jesus, which was actually offering, offering saying, hey, if you will sell and trade the temporary possessions of this life, you will get eternal possessions and you get to follow me. He heard that and heard bad news. And we'll be the same way. If we're not eternally minded, we'll hear God call us to do something. God may call you and say, I want you to start a Jesus disciple group with your neighbors. And we hear, shoot, man, my Friday nights are normally me time, right? Or my Friday nights are normally designated to this or, or that. And we'll hear it and it'll be bad news to us. Why? We're not in the right mindset. We are not operating in a kingdom-minded state of mind. And it's not just obviously Jesus disciple groups. He may ask you to give to somebody in need. And what you view it as, man, I'm, I'm already, I got stuff that I'm trying to do and stuff that I'm trying to get or, or this and that. And Jesus is saying, when he calls you to do things, if you are kingdom minded, then what you'll actually hear is an invitation to advance the kingdom of God. What you'll actually hear is an opportunity to invest into eternity. That's what you'll actually hear. But the rich young ruler didn't hear that. What the rich young ruler heard made him sorrowful. I wanna close with this and then I wanna give some time to respond here. But you know, if we can catch what I believe the Lord is trying to say, calling us to be eternally minded, and I believe this is very practical in its application, by the way. I believe that there are very likely things that you or anyone watching online very specifically have elevated above its proper place that you've started to view this thing, this opportunity, this whatever appreciation from other people or whatever it is, you've started to view this at this level and you valued the eternal things, including eternity and reaching people and pleasing God as very little. And the Lord is saying, you need to recalibrate how you value things today. Would you take a step back and recognize this thing that I'm fretting over, this thing that I'm so consumed by is gonna die when I die. And maybe sooner because... God's going to deliver me. But right now, regardless, no matter how this, this, this thing is playing out, there is an eternity waiting for me that can't be taken away from me. Man, that alone, no wonder believers are supposed to have joy and peace that surpasses understanding. Here's how you don't get joy and peace that surpasses understanding. You don't just muscle your way into it. You don't just in a storm say, I will have peace. You don't do that. It is, it is actually a byproduct of the revelation of who he is, what he's done and where you'll be. That's, that's where the peace and joy comes from. It's not a forcing of it. When you understand who he is as the King of Kings, as your Lord and Savior who died for you, when you understand what he's done, that he died for you while you were still a sinner and washed you clean. And when you understand where you will be, that no matter what happens on this earth, in this life, you will be in heaven forever and ever. When you have that revelation, then the storm may come and yet you have peace. The issue may come, the trial may come and yet you have joy. Why? Because your joy and peace is staked in something deeper than any circumstance. It's deeped in the big picture and you are eternally minded. I love what this says in Romans chapter eight. And my prayer is that you receive what this says and catch this. The word of God is living and powerful as, as it says in the word of God. And I believe God is wanting to open our eyes to see some things here. And so in fact, Lord, as I read Romans chapter eight, God, oh, help us to catch what you're trying to say to us, Lord. What you're trying to say to us today is, is bigger and more important than I, I can communicate, Lord. I can't, I can't properly compel people with my words. It has to be your Holy Spirit, Lord, opening our eyes. So open our eyes to see. In fact, if you want the Lord to help you to see the way he sees things, then just ask him right now. Say, Lord, open my eyes to see, God, the way you see things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Romans chapter eight, starting in verse 35, says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Catch this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no amount of people coming after you or talking bad about you or putting you down or 
all of that, no famine or nakedness, no, no matter how much lack there seems to be, nor peril or sword, even violence, attacks, none of that can separate us from the love of Christ. As it is written, for your sake, for the Lord's sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Believers back in the early days of the church and at certain places all around the world today had it differently than we have it here in America as believers. We haven't tasted persecution the way that the early church tasted persecution. We haven't tasted persecution the way many believers do in other countries. And we haven't tasted persecution the way that the book of Revelation says that we will one day taste persecution. And so, but this is, this is a generation of believers that are under immense persecution. The author of this, uh, of the book of Romans is Paul being led by the Holy Spirit. But Paul had been through immense persecution. He had been beaten and whipped multiple times in prison. He was stoned. They thought they had killed him. They had stoned him to death, they thought. But he got up and walked away. He had been shipwrecked. He had been condemned. He had been put down by all the people he used to call friends, persecuted in about every way you can possibly imagine, all the way leading up to his martyrdom and his, him being put to death. And yet he's the one writing here and he's saying, can anything separate us from the love of Christ? He's saying nothing, no tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no peril and no sword. And then he says this, yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, he says, I am persuaded. He's saying, I, I, I have come to know, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, you may have heard the news recently that Iran attacked Israel and Israel attacked back. And, and this is what the Bible declares will happen in the last days. It says that wars and rumors of wars will start to come up and all of this. And we don't know exactly when the book of Revelation is gonna play out, but we do know it is going to play out. And there's no amount of prayer that can stop it from playing out. God said it will happen, it will happen. But what we can do is we can pray and prepare for what's gonna happen. And we don't know all that's gonna happen in this world. I don't know. I've heard people talking about how much longer will it be till World War III breaks out or till the whole world is at war, till everything changes. And the answer is like James, like it says in the book of James, we don't know. We don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow, but here's what I will tell you. If, if we as believers here in America or in Western cultures or wherever you may abide watching online, if we are not eternally minded, if the world goes into chaos, we'll go into chaos right with them. If the world loses who, who they are, if the world loses life as we know it, we'll lose it too. And we'll, we'll lose ourselves in the whole process because we'll fall right in it. But if we are eternally minded, if we are set on this that says, no, no matter what happens, let me, let me read it again a little more descriptive. Let me say it this way. Neither death nor life, life, death itself cannot separate you from the love of God, nor angels, nor principalities or powers. The devil himself, Satan, some of you walk around fearful of the devil and what demons will do and all that, and they have no power over you, nor things present, nor anything you're going through, nor things to come, nor anything that'll ever come your way nor height, nothing is high enough, nor depth, nothing is deep enough, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, if we have a revelation of that, then even if the whole world, no matter what happens, even if the whole world goes to chaos, guess what? We are okay. Because we know no matter what happens in this life, we have a savior who loves us that we can never be separated from, no matter what happens in this life. We know we are going to be in eternity with God Almighty forever. See, that is an eternally minded believer. And, and we need those. I believe in a lot of ways, God is preparing believers for what's to come. And again, I don't know exactly when. We know what the book of Revelation tells us, but we don't know exactly when. It doesn't say when. Exactly, but it says you, you will know the signs of the times and we're seeing things. But here's where we need to be as believers. When the book of Revelation starts to play out and pan out, we need people in, in chaotic scenarios. There's downsides to it, but I'll tell you what's an upside. People become really open to the gospel. In, in scenarios where things get tough, people all of a sudden that didn't want to hear, now they want to hear, wait, what are you saying? What are you saying? But if believers are a mess themselves, 
if believers are in chaos themselves, then we won't even be able to present the gospel to them because we're a master. But if we are eternally minded, like these people paved the way, this generation of believers in the early church in the Bible, they paved the way of what it means to be eternally minded. So much so that the, that the early church, when they accepted the Lord, they made an individual decision themselves. They weren't all forced to do this. They each decided we want to sell everything we have and we want to give it that it can just be distributed to whoever needs it. And they all in unity, they all, this massive group of people all said, yeah, let's sell everything we've got. Let's put it together and let's distribute as needed. You know, the only way you can do that is if you have the mindset of eternity. They caught something that we need to catch, which is this life is a vapor. It comes and goes. So what? So what if everything, for some of those people, some of those people got the short end of the sick. They sold and gave way more than they got back. And yet they said, so what? It's not about this. This is why they would go in chains all the way up to their death, proclaiming the name of Jesus. It's because their mind was fixed on eternity that this is not the big thing. This life is not the big thing. We are simply passing through. In fact, let me say it this way. If you were to go stay in an Airbnb for seven days, the ratio of those seven days to your life would be bigger than the ratio of this life to eternity. This life compared to eternity is not even seven days worth of your life in comparison. This life is literally, it says it's a vapor. It's a vapor. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes can get so consumed into this life. I can put my head down and just be thinking about this and that and what I want, what I need and my aspirations. And I need to be able to say, God, I take a step back. And I say, Lord, even if my life panned out nothing like I want, there's a bigger picture here, Lord. And it's called eternity. It's called everlasting life that you've paid for. Can we stand up together? Is anyone grateful that there is nothing high enough, nothing deep enough, nothing wide enough, nothing strong enough to separate us from the love of the Lord? Oh, listen, when you catch that revelation, you have such security. Oh, you have such a foundation of strength because no matter what this life throws at you, you know, that, they, it can't take that away. Oh no, that's not going anywhere. This is why Paul said when they were threatening to kill him, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What's he saying? He's saying, if I get to live, that's to represent Christ and do what he says. But if you want to kill me, go ahead. And guess what? I gain, I win. I get to go see the one I've been serving my whole life. We get to see him. We get to see the one we've been following face to face. I don't know where you are exactly in your life. We're going to take a moment and worship here. But I know the Lord is saying that he's trying to wake up some believers. I don't know if you're at a place, maybe you're at a place where you just know, as, as I'm sharing today, you just know there are some things that you've been treating like the big deal. And it's not. And the Lord is saying, it's not, it's not that you shouldn't pursue it. Maybe you should. Maybe God's calling you to do it. But God is not calling you to elevate it above its proper place. Maybe some of you have not been living with eternity in mind at all. You've been living as if this life is the thing. And God is saying, you need to, you need to let that go. You need to let that go. You need to live knowing this is not the thing. This is not the thing. This is a vapor that comes and goes. And the real thing is called eternity, which by the way, Jesus said he goes there to prepare a place for you and that he's making many mansions. And let me just say this too. The Bible says God created the world in six days. That's what it says in Genesis. And yet Jesus says when he left, he went up to go to prepare a place. Jesus has been preparing a place for you for 2,000 years. You think it's not beautiful? You think it's not incredible? You think it's not nothing like anything we've ever seen? It, it is beyond what we could even imagine. And we get to be there forever and ever and ever and ever. So don't, don't bow down to this storm as if this is the big thing in your existence. It is not. Even if it's incredibly difficult and God has compassion for incredibly difficult storms. But if you remember the big picture, you're able to say, God, I know this isn't forever though. No matter how hard it is, I know it's not forever. Can we worship the Lord together? Come on, let's give him some honor in this place for who he is. Oh, we give you all the honor and praise. We lift our hands in the sanctuary. We set our minds on you, Jesus. We set our minds on the things of heaven. Oh, may we catch what you see, Lord. Open our eyes, open our eyes, God. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Oh, 
I want to give an opportunity, anybody in here that you have not made Jesus your Lord, you want that firm foundation of security in Him, but you know you need to. Just right now, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Just right now, wherever that's you, you can just confess to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe in you. I believe you died and were raised from the dead and I, I give you my life, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, I feel like the Lord is saying before we go here that there are just a couple things that maybe we need to lay on the altar before the Lord. Maybe there are some things that we've been elevating beyond its proper place. We've, we've misallocated value to some things and, and some things have started to consume our mind, our, our heart, or be our priority that we need to say with our mouth, Lord, that is not the priority. Some of you need to say with your mouth, God, while, you know, something like God, while saving is good, while, while having a good career is good, while working hard is good, it's not you and you are more important than all of those things, God. And so I lay those at your feet and I say, God, I will work hard. I will, I will be diligent and yet I will prioritize you above anything else. God, some of you need to lay that at your feet. Some of you need to lay whatever it is at the feet of Jesus, but come on out of your own mouth. Even those of you watching online, if you're able to just take a moment and, and whatever you need to say, God, I surrender this to you. God, I put this in its rightful place. I've been treating this thing like it is the big thing and it is not. It is a blip amongst the vapor of a life that is basically nothing compared to eternity, Lord. Lord, help us to prioritize the way that you do, God. I believe the Lord is calling us to call out to him and not just now, but listen throughout the week as you go about your life to ask him and to say, God, help me to see things the way that you see things. See, because God sees things from the big picture. We insert too much of ourselves often in, in the picture and our own interests. And yet God sees the big picture. This is so often why our priorities and the way we want things don't align with the way he wants things and does things. Sometimes we want God to do it exactly like this. And yet sometimes God does it a little bit differently. And here's why God, God is constantly keeping in mind the view of the big picture, constantly. While we don't, we get narrow-minded and yet God constantly sees the big picture. And that's why we trust him. And yet one thing that I love about him that's hard to even understand is though this life is a vapor, it comes and it goes, though eternity is the big picture, yet God still cares about what scenario you're in right now. He still cares about that. He still wants you to have healing now in this life. He still wants you to be blessed and taken care of in this life. And yet Jesus said, there's a way to do it. And it's called seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll add these things to you. When we seek the things, he doesn't come with it. When we seek him, the taking care of our needs comes with it. It comes with it. So right now, wherever you are, if, if you desire for the Lord to help you to see things, which includes people, by the way, this is the last thing I promise-ish. This is the last thing. God sees people different than we see people. And when we have eternity in mind, we just see things differently. We just see that neighbor and maybe, maybe, it's, maybe there's a neighbor that's really frustrating in your neighborhood. It's hard to deal with. And when you're not eternally minded, you just see them as a stumbling block, as a nuisance in the area. But when you're eternally minded, you see someone who needs Jesus. You see someone who needs to be pursued and reached with the love of God. You see things differently. God sees people different than we see people. When we, when we get to Starbucks or wherever we go or Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm and there's a long line, we see, man, a big barrier to us and fun. But you know what Jesus saw when he saw the multitudes of people that came with, when they were pressing against him, they wanted, I mean, there was a lot of issues that comes. There's a lot of issues that comes with multitudes of people. And yet when Jesus saw them, it says his heart was moved with compassion because what he saw was a bunch of people that are lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd, he said. What do you see when you see people? What do I see? 
We need to, we need to pursue being kingdom minded, eternally minded so that even when we see people, we see what God sees, which are opportunities opportunities to take people, which are the one thing we can take from this earth to heaven with us. We can't take your car, your house, your possessions, your esteem from others. You can't take any of that with you. What you can take is your neighbor. You can, you can preach the gospel to your neighbor and disciple them and help see them get to heaven. So Lord, would you do this wherever you are? If you want to be eternally minded, if you wanna see things the way that God sees things, then would you just repeat after me in this place, if that's you and you wanna see things in an eternal way, say, Lord, help me to see things the way that you see things. Help me to be eternally minded, not so focused on me, not so focused on the here and now, but focused on your will, focused on what's on your heart, Help my perspective to be aligned with your perspective. Help me to lay things down that I need to lay down and to walk with you, with your kingdom and eternity in mind. In Jesus' name, and let me pray over you really briefly. Lord, I pray over each and every person in here and every person watching online. Lord, would you renew their mind as your word says that you transform us by the renewing of our mind. God, would you give them a kingdom mindset? Would you give them a mind that is eternally minded, God, that it's focused on what's really important, that we don't overvalue things that don't matter. Uh, Lord, I also pray, and I feel this is on the heart of God to pray. Lord, I also pray over everybody in here that is dealing with depression or anxiety. Uh, or cloudiness or confusion. Lord, I pray that you would, even through this revelation of who you are, what you've done and where we'll be, Lord, that you would uh, free them from that, Lord, that you would give them the freedom. I thank you, Lord, that even though you are the God of eternity, you care even about the present moment, Lord. You care for some reason, God, even about the little details in our lives. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray over anyone who is under financial pressure, Lord, that you would bring a peace and prosperity to them, Lord, that you would provide everything that it is that they need as your word says, Lord. I pray over anyone that's battling with addiction, Lord, that you would remind them, God, that whom the sun sets free is free indeed, that you would remind them, God, that they are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that you would remind them, God, that a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. Lord, that you would strengthen them. And Lord, I pray strength over each and every person watching this or listening, God, that you would strengthen them to lean into being eternally minded, that you would help us each to take a step back and let what comes out of our mouth be what represents the big picture, which may look something like, yeah, this storm is bad. It doesn't feel good. It's tough. And yet my God is my great deliverer. And I will be with him not only now in this life, but forever and ever and ever and ever. And nothing in this life can separate me from the love of God. Lord, let that be what comes out of our mouth and the way we live our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. If you agree, can we say amen or clap our hands in agreement? Amen, amen, amen.